All right. So hi, everyone. Welcome. and Thank you for tuning into our first fall panel session on college affordability and scholarships. Um, my name is Claudia Avilas, and I'm the program manager with the Coalition for College. We are using the Zoom webinar today, and we have turned on the closed captions. Um, we also have the Q&A function enabled, so feel free to ask your questions throughout the session today, and we'll try our best to address your questions during the Q&A portion at the end. Um, this session is being recorded today, and it's going to be shared with anybody who registered later this week. Um, and for our discussion today, I'm joined by admission professionals from coalition member schools um, who will share their expert inf advice on how to make college affordable, securing scholarships, and applying to financial aid. Um, they are going to be introducing themselves shortly, um, and we're also going to be dropping some links in the chat with some more information on this topic, so you might see links shared throughout. Just know that these are resources that you could check out when you have some free time. So before we begin, I do want to tell you a little bit about the Coalition for College. So the Coalition is 170 colleges and universities with a proven commitment to access, affordability, and student success. As a group, we work together to help students learn about, prepare for, and apply to college. We believe that coalition schools are smart college choices because they not only provide responsible financial aid, but they also graduate students in a timely manner, including students who have been historically underrepresented in higher education. Students at our member schools are successful regardless of the size the selectivity of the institution. Coalition members are committed to access, providing responsible financial support for students and support to ensure that uh, students are graduating in a timely manner. And most importantly, students are succeeding. So as a collective, Coalition schools outperform the national averages by 24 percentage points when it comes to graduation rates, which is an important factor for you to consider when you're thinking about the amount of time and money that you're going to be investing in your education. So when thinking about where you want to apply, a great place to start your search could be by exploring the uh, coalition schools that are dedicated to making uh, a college education both accessible and affordable. Many of our member schools use our shared application platform, which is integrated within SCORE. And if you hadn't heard of SCORE yet, that's okay. Um, it's a college planning platform that's free for students to use. On SCORE, students can not only search and discover both two and four year colleges, but you can also collaborate with um, your supporters. So people like your counselors, your advisors, your parents, guardians. And then when you're ready to apply, you can use a coalition application directly from your SCORE account and keep track of all your applications to the schools to which you apply. And because this application method is only available to coalition member schools, you know that you're applying to schools that are dedicated to helping students graduate on time with low or no debt. And we will be dropping a link in the chat where you can learn more. Or you can scan this QR code that's on the screen if you'd like to get started on that. The coalition and its members work to help students learn about, prepare for, and apply to college. And if you're interested in receiving information about all things college, feel free to give us a follow on Instagram and TikTok, where we do share different insights um, and highlight member schools. Um, and if you have questions following today's session, feel free to give us, um, send us an email uh, at info at coalitionforcollege.org. So when it comes to our topic of affording college, um, the thought can be overwhelming, especially considering the fact that um, the, the cost of college is rising every year. Um, but I'm here to tell you, along with um, fellow coalition member uh, school professionals, that there are financial aid resources available to all students that can make college affordable, regardless of how much money your family may make, your grades, or citizenship status. And according to the National Center for Education Statistics, more than 85% of students get help paying for college. 
So just wanted to highlight that information with you all tonight. And as I mentioned earlier, I am joined by an incredible group of folks from coalition member schools from Ithaca, um, Northeastern, and the University of South Carolina. And they're going to share some advice on affording college and scholarships and answering um, all the questions that come in today. So I'll go ahead and let each person introduce themselves. And we'll start off with Shanna. Hi, thank you, Claudia. I'm Shana Gore, the Associate Vice President for Enrollment and Student Success at Ithaca College. We are a new member institution with Coalition, so we're very excited to be joining this group. Um, I have been at Ithaca College for almost four years, uh, but I've been in higher ed for just about 20, and the majority of my time in higher ed I have spent in some capacity in the financial aid office. Um, and I think, I know we're going to answer lots of questions tonight. Um, if I could uh, share one thing, I would share with, with everyone to ask all of the questions. Um, I'm a first generation college student. And I think when I was starting the process, I sometimes um, hesitated to ask questions. I thought that everyone else already knew the, the terminology that was being thrown around. They knew the, the answers and that I was just trying to kind of listen and pick it up. Um, Students are investing so much, a significant amount of their time, their energy, their money, and you deserve to ask all the questions that you want and need to have answered. Um, as many questions as you need to and as many times as you need to. So ask all the questions. Thank you. And I'm Steve Wynn. I'm with Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm an Associate Director of Customer Experience and Student Financial Services with a focus on financial aid, uh, but our office is under enrollment management and we collaborate across with admissions and different uh, departments and colleges across campus. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm uh, very honored to be a presenter and I'll kind of build on what Shana said that engagement to in asking questions is one of the most critical parts of the work that we do. Um, one thing that will frustrate everyone within our office and probably my colleagues as well is when a student comes at the last minute or comes at a time when there isn't as much we can do for the student given the time it is within a term. So kind of building on what Shana said, the earlier you come and ask a question in our office, the better. So that goes for admissions before you're admitted. And then once you're admitted into an institution and you may have a question about your financial aid or an available scholarship, go early. Early in the morning, 8.30, knock on the door, we're there. Um, you know, it's kind of like trying to get in at 5.15 when the office is closed. Um, be there early and ask a lot of questions. That's really important. And good evening. My name is Joey Derrick. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Enrollment Management and Director of Student Financial Aid and Scholarships at the University of South Carolina. I've been in the financial aid office for 26 years. Um, building upon what, what my colleagues here have, have, have mentioned, along with asking questions, it's really important to also read everything that you get um, from any offices once you've been admitted. Just read the fine print. If you're a scholarship recipient, read the requirements to maintain it. All of those important little things that get missed, and sometimes there are things that you can't go back and redo. So I would suggest it's a lot of reading. There's a lot of things. You get a lot of a lot of information coming at you, but it's really important to take a few minutes and make sure you've read all the information that the school provides to you. And again, thank you for having me here. I'm looking forward to answering the questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, so for this session, we're going to cover some of the most common questions that were submitted with registration. So thanks to all of you who submitted questions. And then we'll tackle any other questions that come through in the Q&A. Um, for any of you who have to leave the call early, know that this session is being recorded and it's going to be emailed to everyone soon. So let's go ahead and get into these questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen as well. And the first question that I have, I'm going to throw over to Joey. Joey, um, are there any tools or resources that students and families can use to estimate how much a college may cost? Yeah, this is a tough one. This can be very confusing. Um, when you look at costs at an institution, there's a couple different ways to look at it. You know, you can look at the amount that you think the bill will be, and you can look at the amount that you might spend overall in a year in college, both with your direct and indirect costs. Um, a lot of schools, most schools are required to have what's called a net price calculator posted prominently on a website. 
that is the tool that you can use. Um, a lot of times those are based on averages and um, some are better than others. That's the place to start. Um, another one you can look at is, is uh, schools financial aid websites are required to post their costs of attendance. That it can be a very confusing term, cost of attendance. That is, ref that is meant to reflect all of a student's direct and indirect costs for a year. So it's not just tuition and fees, it's also things like books and transportation and living expenses and everything else. But one of the things that I recommend folks do, after you look at those two, go to the, go to, go to the school's fee, uh, fee structure website, look at where their fees are posted. That's where you're gonna see the actual fees for this year. You're going to see lab fees, you're going to see program fees, you'll see matriculation fees. All those fees that maybe aren't mentioned up front, but if you look through an institution's fee schedule, you'll find out how much it's actually going to cost. And one of the things that I find a lot of times working with, with families is uh, many folks, of course, in the industry think that the cost of attendance is what drives a lot of questions. And it does, it is important, but what I find a lot of times is that when the rubber hits the road, folks want to know what the bill is going to be, right? They want to know how much they're going to have to come out of pocket. And in order to get that as accurate as possible, that's going to come from the uh, the school's uh, fee structure website. Uh, some schools uh, pu publish their upcoming fees very early. Uh, schools like us, we have to wait for our board of trustees to set those fees. So sometimes, for example, if you're you may look at the University of South Carolina's website and you may see the fees out here for the previous year if you're looking at it in April and May. And that's because the uh, fees haven't been set for the upcoming year, but it's still a good tool, still something good to use. I would recommend using all three of those together to get a good idea of what your overall costs might be and then what your bill might be. Thank you so much, Joey, for providing that overview. Um, my next question, I'm going to go ahead and direct to Steve. Steve, what resources um, and or support is available for students who are first in their family to attend college and may need additional guidance on planning in this area? That, that's a great question. So I can speak specifically about Northeastern, but also we're a part of our state higher ed association and our regional association. So I know the vast majority of uh, institutions that are part of those associations are very focused on first gen students. At Northeastern, I know it's uh, particularly post COVID, it's been um, a number of different, and I do have to look at my notes to make sure I get everything correct. So we have our Center for Intercultural Engagement that has FUNNEL, F-U-N-L, for first gen undocumented and low income students. We have a We Care support network, which is uh, across our multiple campuses all over the United States and around the world. We have our Student Cultural Center and Career Resources. All of those coordinate with us in student financial services to make sure we have educational opportunities during the course of a term in the year to interact with students. We have our, each year we have our first gen week on November one through eight, where students get an opportunity to meet with different departments across campus and really understand the, sometimes there's a hesitancy with certain groups of students to even come into our office if they're not feeling comfortable. So it really is our being proactive and being out there so that they meet individuals from our offices and they can learn from us. It's also, we have learned very important um, on my staff. I have folks who are fluent in Spanish, French, Arabic, Mandarin, and Cantonese, um, which is really helpful to be able to outreach to not only students, but their families if they're there. If English is a second language to the parent, sometimes a student might be more fluent in English than a parent, but it goes beyond just working with the student as well, it's the family. And so at our orientation sessions at the beginning of the term, at our events for admissions for the upcoming class of 2025, 26, um, there definitely is a focus on the individual resources that are gonna be specifically important for first gen students. I appreciate you sharing that, Steve. Thank you so much for giving that that overview and talking about those resources and support that um, is available to students. And um, I think regardless of the institution, these are things that they can ask about at, at any institution that they may, right. may be looking into. So sure. thank you for sharing. Um, 
Uh, my next question, I am going to direct to Shanna. Shanna, can you share what advice you would give to students and families who are concerned about the rising cost of attending college? Sure. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, college is an investment. Um, and, you know, as you look at that and think about it rising, um, you know, I think it's to put it into perspective. Um, the cost for you know, everyday things um, is just expected to to rise. But when you're looking at the big picture, it's really about researching all of the different types of financial aid and resources that are available to help students meet that cost. Um, there are programs from federal, state, and institutional levels. So, you know, we talk about filling out the FAFSA as soon as it's available. Um, and, you know, making sure that they're aware of all of those different programs from scholarships that may be based on academic merit or talent, um, grants that may be based on need, and then looking for opportunities to participate in work study or some type of campus employment that can be used towards those costs. Um, and then, you know, saving those loans is kind of a last option and borrowing very responsibly. Um, I think also it's very important for students and families to realistically look at their budget and not just look at that first year. Um, you're not just attending college for one year. It is a four-year commitment, um, at least, to earn your degree in most cases. And so you really want to think about that big picture and budget and plan for four years. And so there are some schools that are able to help students um, know what that cost is for four years. Some students have different um, tuition guarantees or different financial aid packages that walk through that. But even if they don't, those schools can talk to you about what their cost increase um, typically look like year over year. And so again, students and families need to think about what their commitment is for four years and not just that first year and really look at a plan that's going to be the big picture for, um, for four years um, and how they're going to cover those. Um, and I think too, it comes down to looking at all the different types of education. You know, look at the community college options, look at are there online options, um, and look at the different costs associated with all of those options. Um, I'm coming from a private school, and you know that cost is very different than community colleges, and we have partnerships with community colleges for students to do two years where they're able to um, live at home, have a lower per credit hour rate, um, and then we have pathway programs to transfer and finish up the last two years at Ithaca College. And so there's just so many different options and combinations and opportunities. Um, and so it's really about research and understanding all of those and finding the option that's going to uh, best meet the needs of the students and their family. Thank you for highlighting some of those um the pathway programs, like you said, that exist and like researching all of the different options, Shana, I really appreciate that. Um, my next question I have, I'm going to uh, throw over to Steve. Um, Steve, can you talk a little bit about what role do extracurricular activities, volunteer work, leadership experiences um, play in scholarship applications and financial aid decisions? They do. They also play into admissions decisions. So looking for the unique student that's going to bring something to the table to the university um, is incredibly important. So to have a diversified student population, not only geographically, but the interests that the student has. And so a student who may have had, uh, you know, excelled in athletics or excelled in the arts or excelled in academics, um, having a specific scholarship at a, a uh, Shana mentioned Ithaca is a private college, as is Northeastern, and we have many opportunities for scholarships that are specifically tied to those areas and recognition of the work that a student has done in high school. So it is very important to also point out those differentiators in your application. You may be using the Common App, which is you know a general application that schools use, but Northeastern has an addition to the Common App, and it's really important to make sure your looking at the uniqueness that you bring to an admissions opportunity at a university and what it is about you that the university is going to want to look at and say, yes, and oh, by the way, we have XYZ scholarship. We have this endowed scholarship that is going to be perfect for you. So again, building on what Shana said, a large institution like Ithaca or Northeastern or University of South Carolina may not be the best fit for every student. So also recognizing when you're looking at a school, where will the best fit be for me? And that is as important as the amount of a scholarship you might be getting. So really understanding you're there for four years, five years at institutions 
like Northeastern Little Rufford Co-op, um, but really knowing there's a difference in how the scholarship may, scholarships may be applied as a first year incoming student. And then when you are at an institution, there may be further scholarship opportunities as you go into your second, third and fourth year. So it's always keeping the antenna open to see what opportunities may be there. Thank you, Steve, for elaborating on that. Um, Shana, I'm going to go back to you and throw another question to you. Um, could you talk about what are the key steps that students and families should take when starting their search for things like college scholarship? Sure. That's a great question. I think that can often feel overwhelming. Um, there are so many places to look and so many different types of scholarships. Um, I think I would start with having the student really um, take a look at themselves and start identifying um, what are their strengths, their interests, their background, because um, many scholarships have very specific eligibility criteria. Um, they're looking for specific academics, they're looking for specific extracurriculars or maybe demographics. So for a student to, to take some time to identify um, what their strengths are. Um, another thing that I've seen is very successful for students is to create a scholarship calendar. Um, there are so many different deadlines and so um, you know, in addition to everything else that a high school student may have going on, um, keeping up with the deadlines for the scholarship applications, being able to know when they submitted them, um, if there was a date by which they should have expected to hear back from them, knowing when they should follow up with them, if supplemental materials need to be turned in, and also if they are awarded a scholarship, knowing if there is um, a date in the future when they may need to turn in a copy of their bill or they may need to reapply in a future year. So I think setting up that calendar is going to be very helpful for a student to be able to stay on top of it because it's just a lot to have to manage all of those different dates. Um, there's different scholarship search engines. I think we may get into that a little bit um, later. So there are places there where they can search by putting in some information about themselves. I also think checking with their high schools. Sometimes their guidance offices may have information about scholarships that are tailored to students um, from their high school in their area or maybe match up with some of the programs that their high schools are offering. Um, I also think if there are, you know, checking with the schools that they're considering attending, they will have information again about scholarships that are specific to um, to that school. Um, you know, Steve has talked to us about some of the scholarships that Northeastern has, but also they may have um, information on the website for scholarships that students can apply for that are outside of the institution, but are often awarded to students that are coming to the institution. Um, it's also a great idea to check with different uh, civic and community organizations. So there, they sometimes have scholarships for students in the area to apply for. Um, I think another good source is as uh, parents, employers, or if the student is employed to check with their employer, they have scholarships. Um, I've seen students receive scholarships from, you know, smaller scholarships that help out with books to large scholarships that cover a good portion. So, um, you know, I think that it can be tough for students and families because sometimes you have to cast the net very wide and do many applications. Um, but sometimes those can pay off in the end, um, you know, with different scholarships different scholarships being able to come in. So it is a lot of searching and a lot of kind of turning over all of the stones. Um, and it certainly doesn't help for, or doesn't hurt for students to get a good uh, personal statement essay together and some references to have those ready to go as different scholarship opportunities come up, I would say as well. Thank you so much um, for sharing some of those steps that families and students should take. I feel like one of the big things that you mentioned is like making sure you're organized, right? And ha have a place where you're keeping track of deadlines, but also looking in places that are um, not so maybe conventional, right? Like talking to different, um, talking to counselors, different community organizations and um, employers. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, the next question I have, I'm going to throw over to Joey. Joey, could you shed light on what scholarship displacement is? Um, and also, how can students and families find out if a college may do this? Sure, that's a, that's a great question. Basically, what scholarship di displacement is, is um, a school may put together a student's aid package and it includes a series of scholarships. And then once the school learns of external scholarships the student receives, they may reduce the scholarships that they're offering to that student equal to or less than the amount that they're getting from an outside source. 
Um, and it, it's it's uh, it's an area that's driven that draws a lot of criticism. Um, it has drawn the interest of legislators in several states. Um, several states have enacted bans on that action. Um, it gets a little complicated, though. I, I, I do want to just peel back the layers a little bit on this. Um, in some cases, you know, schools are, are seeking to maximize their financial aid dollars. If they determine a student perhaps did not need as much as they thought they did, they're seeking to, to maximize that by moving it to another student. However, um, to the student who is being affected by this, that seems unfair, right? Because the school has offered them some money. Um, they knew they had money come from somewhere else. They were planning on getting both, right? And the, and the school has makes a change, and then the, the family finds themselves uh, scrambling to try to make up the difference. But I also want to point out that it, it's not terribly uncommon for a school to be required to do this also. It's not uncommon to have to reduce the scholarship because of the rules around that scholarship. Um, we have several donor funded scholarships we see nowadays that are what we call last dollar scholarships. And they may be one amount today, but if another scholarship comes in, the requirements around that funded scholarship say that they must be reduced. Uh, some states have state scholarship programs that are also what they call last dollar, which means that they must be reduced to maintain within some kind of threshold, whether it's the cost of attendance or direct cost or whatever legislation dictates. So there are times that schools do this because they're required to do so. Uh, we do get some folks who, who, who think that, who feel that they're being deceived in those cases. And in those cases, a school is following what they're legislatively required to do. Thank you, Joey, for shedding light on that. Um, I know that that was definitely something that that folks were curious about. So thank you for for sharing that. Um, the next question I have, I'm going to throw over to Shana. We're going to come back to you. Um, but I Actually, before we do so, I know my colleague Derek, just for folks on the call, my colleague Derek did drop um, a link in the, the chat. So for those of you who um, are, I know that there were questions about um, scholarship resources. There is um, a link that you can use to find some more information on scholarship resources, because I know that that question has come in the Q&A a couple of times. So just wanted to sh throw that out there. Um, but Shana, I did want to throw this next question to you. Um, so can you explain the differences between federal, state, and institutional financial aid and how students and families should go, um, should approach applying for each? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think the main thing is apply for everything. Um, I think the first step is always going to be the FAFSA. Uh, I don't know any school that's not going to require the FAFSA. That's going to be required for any type of federal financial aid. That would be your need-based grants, such as the Pell Grant or the Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. Um, those would be the big ones. That's also required for federal work study. Um, and it's even required if students will just be planning to take out the federal direct loans. I think that's something that... Um, Sometimes first year students and their families are a little surprised that they have to fill out the financial aid application if they're just intending to take out a loan. So that would be important there. Um, after that, when we get into state funding, some states will use the FAFSA to determine eligibility for their state aid. Some states will have their, their own separate application that students may need to uh, also complete. So um, at the colleges in the state of New York, uh, we have a need-based TAP grant and students have to fill out a separate application through the state to be eligible for that. Um, when it comes to state funding, some of the state funding is need-based, some of it is merit-based, some states have both. Um, so again, that's going to be very specific to your state. That's where that kind of research and learning the information comes in. Um, and then it's also handled differently in, in states. So some states give a allotment to the school, and then the school determines kind of who gets it and how much they're able to receive. And then um, like in the state of New York with the TAP grant, the state is determining the amount that students are um, eligible to receive. Most of the time, um, the maximum amount is for state residents who are attending school in their home state. There are a few states that students are able to take their state grant out of state. Usually it's a smaller amount that they receive to go out of state. Um, but I would say that's um, 
that's not the standard. So I would not expect that to happen. Um, and very rarely, if you are leaving your home state to attend school in another state. So if you live in Virginia and you're going to school in Nebraska, Nebraska would normally not give you state funding from their state because you're not a resident of their state. So um, those are things that it's going to be very important for you to know the information from your home state and uh, work closely with the school that you're planning to attend. When it gets into institutional funding, um, some schools will use the FAFSA to determine eligibility for their institutional funding. Some schools will use the CSS profile. This is a separate financial aid application. Um, there is a fee to, to submit that application. Some schools have their own institutional application that you would fill out through their, through their website. So again, um, depending on the, the schools that you're planning to attend, you'll need to research the information on their website and make sure you're filling out the right application. Um, and then some schools have specific scholarships or scholar programs at their school that have their own application for them. Um, so I, I wish I could say that it was more consistent and just one clear, clear place to do everything, but unfortunately that's not the case. Um, and then when it comes to institutional funding, many schools have merit-based uh, scholarships that will be based on your GPA, maybe class rank, test scores. This is a place too where a school may be test optional and you're not required to submit your test scores, but it may be, test scores may be required for a specific scholarship or a scholar program. Um, so that may be a place where you'll be making a decision about, um, it may not be required for admissions, but if you hope to be considered for a specific scholarship, you would need to take the tests and submit your test scores. Um, schools may also have talent scholarships. So it may be an athletic scholarship or a music or theater scholarship. And so there would be an audition or some type of element to demonstrate your talent. Um, some schools have campus work study programs, payment plans, um, some have their own loan program. So there's just a variety of scholarship, grant, loan, work, aid programs that students can um, tap into to help cover their cost of attendance. So it will really be important to, um, as my colleagues mentioned earlier, read everything, um, do the research and really pay attention to everything that's available. Thank you, Shana. I feel like you really provided a nice overview and, and I think that was really impressive, like the amount of time that you were able to talk about the federal, the state and institutional aid and um, also like those little kind of tidbits that you shared about, you know, you might not be... Um, Admissions might not consider testing, but a merit aid scholarship might require testing. And so I appreciate you sharing um, that information with folks. Um, the next question I have, I'm going to throw over to Steve. Steve, can students and families appeal their financial aid packages? And if so, um, are there strategies for appealing or negotiating a financial aid offer if it doesn't meet the family's needs? There certainly is. And that's a great question to follow up with Shane's answer, just uh, sh sorry, Shana's answer just a couple of seconds ago, because when a student receives a financial aid award, it will likely include all of the different types of aid that Shana referenced. So it will have the federal aid if the student completed the FAFSA. It will have, depending on the institution, uh, institutional aid if the student completed the CSS profile or the university's separate application. And then it will have scholarships and grants that could either be federal, state, uh, institutional. So a student looks at that award letter. Um, Northeastern does award at admission. Not all schools do that. So a student receiving an admissions decision will also have their financial aid award. When you complete the FAFSA, uh, not to get too much into the weeds, but it pulls data from tax information from two years ago. So in the business, we call that prior prior. And what that means is the information that's on the FAFSA for this upcoming year is going to be from 20, uh, 20 math. I'm currently working with students. Thank you. Three. Thank you. Saving, save me. Thank you, Shana. Um, because we're currently working with students who are appealing that are first year students. So they filled out their application with 2022 data. When that happens and a student receives an award letter, um, there are basically two different ways you can appeal. The first is under federal guidance. So most of the work that we do is under uh, federal student aid and through the Department of Education. So there is a type of appeal called, and I never remember it because it's relatively new, appeals for special and unusual circumstances. It used to be called a change in circumstance. That is a federal requirement that the universities are going to be required to follow certain steps to fall in line with what the federal requirements are the type of information that we need from a student. Usually it will mean a 
family has faced a loss in a job, unexpected medical expenses, um, someone lost a job or lost a particular amount of um, income that they would have, and they can appeal through the federal process. An institution, a private institution, public institution may also have institutional appeals. We do at Northeastern, our appeals committee meets every week. So a student may have part of their appeal under the federal regulations and part of their appeal under the institution or the college's regulations. So the answer is a big yes, capital Y-E-S, and a student should definitely be looking at an opportunity to appeal. They are going to have to follow certain strategies. And I did write these down as well. We've mentioned before, ask, ask questions, ask about an appeal as soon as possible. If you are looking at your award and it has come in your admissions decision or weeks after your admissions decision, ask about an appeal if you don't think the award is fairly representing your family's financial situation. Provide full details about why the information on the FAFSA doesn't reflect your family's current financial situation. Provide evidence and documentation. That's going to be incredibly important. Fill out all the forms that the university may be asking you to fill out and then follow up. Because if we are sending an automated message out of our financial aid system asking for an additional document and it needs to be uploaded into a certain system, you have to do that so that we can complete the appeals process. You have to follow the steps that we need in order to complete the appeals process. So there is definitely work the university has to do, but there's work a student has to do to make sure that they're completing all the steps so the appeal gets processed timely. Thank you so much for sharing, Steve. And I feel like um, hopefully for the folks on the call, being able to hear this information early um, and sharing those practical strategies is really helpful. So thank you so much for, for sharing that and, and, and shedding light on that process. Um, my next question is for Joey. Joey, um, how can students and families make the most of their the, of their college financial aid package if their financial aid if their financial situation changes after they've been awarded aid? Great, another great question. And Steve did a great job of of queuing this up. Um, in addition to the the information that Steve shared, there there's such a thing called a professional judgment, which is where a financial aid administrator can go in and make adjustments to a FAFSA based upon a family's current financial situation. Like we talked about the fact that the current FAST is looking at 2022, right? Sometimes that's reflective of a family's financial situation, sometimes it's not. And so an institution can go in and make adjustments on behalf of the family. As Steve said, though, there's often a lot of documentation has to be collected. And sometimes it may feel a little invasive, but just to give you a little behind the scenes, a uh, reason why, from my perspective, these are heavily scrutinized during audits, and uh, reviews very heavily scrutinized. So we're very careful to, to collect appropriate documentation that will show and reflect what the student and family's current financial situation is and how we then make an adjustment to their aid package as a result. It doesn't always result in a change. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It depends upon uh, the student's situation already. A lot of times if they already have a negative student aid index and a full Pell Grant, professional judgment may not make much of a difference, but it's worth asking. And the place to start asking is your financial aid office. And it doesn't have to be before school starts. We get requests like this all year long because it's, it's not uncommon for, for a family to, to encounter a situation that they did not expect a month, two months or more into a, into a school year. Medical expenses, Dislocate, di dislocation of home, all kinds of things can happen. And we want to know about that. We want to make adjustments and make sure we can get aid um, as quickly as possible to these students who may need more than what was originally awarded based upon the FAFSA's uh, data from two years ago. Thank you so much, Joey, for shedding light. That's something that I didn't know. And so I I'm sure folks are learning new things. Um, and I appreciate you sharing the professional judgment and, and providing appropriate documentation if, if a family finds themselves in that situation. Um, my next question I have is for uh, Shana. Shana, what are some common mistakes that students make when applying for financial aid and how can they avoid them? I'm sure sometimes you, you probably heard stories of, oh no, I, I filled this out incorrectly. So what are some common mistakes you see on your end? 
Sure. Um, I think one of the, the main things I would say is for um, students to double check their name, their social security number, and their date of birth when filling out the FAFSA. Um, I, we should double check everything when filling it out, but those three things, um, the Department of Education is running a match based on what is on the student's social security card. And when those three pieces of data do not match, um, it it creates an issue and it's very challenging to get it corrected, but it also tends to create more issues down the road when um, loans are originated, when Pell is originated. So getting those three things correct from the beginning will help make the process smoother all the way down the road. So sometimes, um, you know, it's common in high schools for guidance counselors to call students up and want them to fill it out during a free period, and they may not be 100% sure what their social is. Um, please do not guess. If you're not sure, get the card out, double check. It's very important to start the process to have those three pieces of data correct um, before you submit that application. Um, I think the other big, I think, mistake I would say is missing deadlines. Um, some states are very strict about deadlines when it comes to their state aid. Many states are working with um, you know, reduced resources. And if that deadline is missed, that's it. Um, I think the same is true for some scholarship programs and some scholar programs. They have very strict deadlines. So I would say that um, that may not be a mistake in the sense of like entering information or doing something incorrectly, but missing the deadline could end up costing students and their families a significant amount of money. Um, and then again, just inaccurate information in general. So students are filling out the FAFSA or they're filling out the CSS profile or some type of financial aid application. Um, particularly when we're looking at need-based aid, it is based on that financial picture. And so if something is entered incorrectly, um, it could change what a student's eligible to receive. And so um, some schools may verify information before providing a financial aid package. Some schools are providing the package and they may verify after the fact. Uh, but if the information that is entered was incorrect and you did have a package based on that, it could change when the information is corrected. So, um, you know, I think just checking um, when it comes to the FAFSA, they do have a lot of fine print on there. Um, a lot of the information can well, not can, now it is required to be imported over from the tax return. So that helps to eliminate some of the errors. And then for the other sections where either students or parents are entering the information, there are instructions, there are some of the fine print to read and see what should be included and not included. Sometimes when we get into assets and talking about retirement accounts and 401ks, sometimes parents are including things that they may not be required to include. And so it's actually artificially inflating their student aid index and and making it look like they're ineligible for some things that they may may really be entitled to. Um, same thing when we're looking at um, assets, they should not be including the um, the value of their primary residence. And so that's another case where we see families putting that amount in there. And then again, it's inflating that SAI and sometimes making them ineligible. So um, reading all of the information and if they have questions, reaching out to a financial aid office um, to, to get some help with that. Um, and I will say, you know, when it comes to asking those questions at my school, at Ithaca College, you do not have to be attending Ithaca College. We have relationships with all the local high schools. And so we will do financial aid nights there, but also the high school students are welcome to come in anytime and get help with those questions and their parents. So, um, you know, I think that's important for students and families to know. Uh, the colleges that are in your local area, I would I would think that most of them would be happy to help out with any of those questions that you may have. Thank you so much for shedding some light on that, Shayna. Um, the next question I have, I'm going to throw over to um, Joey. Joey, um, how many financial aid packages differ for in-state versus out-of-state students? And um, what are some strategies that out-of-state students can use to reduce their costs? Yeah, this is a really important concept that sometimes catches <clears throat> students and families off, off guard. Um, a lot of times a state supported school like the University of South Carolina will have a very different tuition rate for students from the state versus those that are from out of the state. So right off the bat, uh, we've got a significant cost differential there. So a student from in state could have an identical aid package to a student from out of state. The student from out of state has a lot more out of pocket to pay because the charges are much higher. And we get questions a lot about why that is. And the reason for that is as a state supported school, we are getting money from the state taxpayers. And so there's an expectation that there'd be a benefit 
to the state taxpayers if they attend the flagship institution of the state like we are. Um, that's one piece of this that drives the aid package. And another piece, and, and Shana alluded to this earlier, is what is the what kind of program does the state offer to students um, who are graduating from high schools in that state? Do they have programs that are only available if you attend an in-state institution? Uh, that's how South Carolina works. South Carolina has several uh, very generous merit-based programs and a pretty generous need-based program as well, but you have to attend an in-state school to receive that money. So a student attending this, the University of South Carolina might be eligible for a, a significant number of programs that a student from outside the state would not, even if their financial situation is identical to someone who's in the state. Now, that doesn't mean that a family shouldn't look at schools out of state. That certainly doesn't, is not the case at all. But what that means is when you're looking at a school out of state, you need to look at the fine print and pay real close attention to what kind of discount rate you're receiving. Um, it's not uncommon for students not to pay the sticker price, if you will. Um, a lot of times an institution will offer scholarships, perhaps with a tuition reduction along with it to entice a student to come from out of state to their institution. And sometimes students simply want to go to an out of state institution and we don't want to discourage that. And that's when sometimes student loan borrowing can come into play. Um, it's not uncommon for us to speak to folks who are very averse to, to borrowing. And that's a good way to be. You know, you want to be careful about how much you borrow. But the federal student loan programs are, are guaranteed. Um, they're, they're stable. They're, they're underwritten. And for a fair number of out-of-state students without a whole lot of gift aid, that's a reality for attending an out-of-state school. And sometimes that's, if that's the school you want to attend, then that's, the, that's, the, that's what you're looking at. And we help a lot of students all the time looking at, at additional loans, either the Federal Parent PLUS loans or even looking at the private loan industry as well. If the school that, that a person wants to attend is not offering a significant amount of aid and the out-of-pocket cost is going to be high. Now, again, it's, it's one of those things where a family has to really look at this and determine whether that's uh, the best choice, and sometimes it is. We don't want folks to make decisions just based upon one, one facet or another, but it's important to look at two facets, as I mentioned. What are the costs for an in-state versus out-of-state student, and what are the aid programs that you would receive if you stayed in the state versus going out of the state? Thank you, Joey. If, oh, Steve, I think you were going to throw something in. No, I just went off mute. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to. I, <laughs> I think I'm up next, in. so I was just going off mute. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, Joey, for sharing that. Um, and yes, Steve, I'll throw this next question to you. Can you provide tips on how students can maximize their chances of receiving merit-based scholarships in addition to need-based aid? Yes. So I think that's a very important question. So a merit scholarship, M-E-R-I-T, is separate from any eligibility assessment a university would be doing for federal student aid through the FAFSA or institutional aid through the CSS or an institutional aid application the university may have. Merit is not part of that need-based assessment. So it is, as we said earlier, uh, an awarding of dollars that a university looks at a student's accomplishments from high school in academics, athletics, the arts, um, leadership, or a special, some type of a special interest. And so recognizing the different population pool that a university is looking at, they want to reward students who have excelled in certain areas. And so they award merit aid. It is, I think, a couple of things important. Uh, a student certainly concentrating on the time that they're in high school and enjoying what they're doing, doing well academically, but also going off into a field or an interest that they have. And then recognizing that is something the university is gonna be looking at in the admissions process. So really highlighting that interest that you've had. As I said earlier, Northeastern does award at point of admission. And so our merit aid is included with the ad, uh, admissions award package. Um, it is important, as uh, Shana recognized, that all of colleges in the United States, the hundreds of colleges, are all different, and they're going to be applying merit aid in a different way. But a couple of points that I also wrote down, I want to make sure I'm looking at my notes, that um, colleges may award merit aid for leadership opportunities in a number of different ways that you've had. You may have been outside of uh, your 
uh, academic work in your high school. It may be a job that you may have had or an interest you had, support of your family, something where a student has shown leadership. Merit may only be applied at the point of admission for the first year. So make sure an important word that we all use is renewable aid. And you wanna make sure that the merit aid, if you're looking at five different colleges that you've applied to, that the merit aid is renewable, that you will receive it year over year, not just for the first year that you're gonna be entering. Some colleges require a separate application for merit aid. Students may need to maintain a certain GPA or a certain course of study in order to stay with a certain merit aid scholarship. And then everyone should be looking at the National Merit Scholarship Program, which offers millions of dollars in aid for students. So that is separate from the institution's merit aid, but it is a merit, a type of merit aid that is accepted at every college in the United States. And that's the National Merit Scholarship Program. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate you sharing. Um, we have a couple questions that um, I'm gonna ask and then we will transition into sharing some um, last words of advice. But um, one question I did wanna pose to Shayna is I have two kids that will be starting college next year. Will that be taken into account in regard to federal financial aid? Um, unfortunately for federal financial aid, the number of family and college is no longer taken into account. Um, that used to be calculated in the formula when determining the previously expected family contribution. Um, and now with the changes and using the student aid index, um, no longer that is no longer accounted for. However, there are some institutions that are offering different types of sibling grants or um, some type of uh, relief for families with multiple children in college. So that's something that will come into play with that research and checking to see what may be offered through different institutions that you may be um, maybe considering attending. Thank you, Shana. Um, the next question I have, I'm going to throw over to Joey. Um, for students who are living abroad, who do, who plan to attend college in the United States and do not have residency in a particular state, is there any advice for um, financial aid and or scholarships? Yeah, this can be a really tough situation. Um, and it's, it, what I suggest uh, to folks in this case is when you're looking at institutions and you, you've narrowed them down, speak with those institutions because the rules can be very complicated on the federal side and they can also be very complicated on the state side um, many states have a statute that drives the residency uh, determination south carolina has a very very complicated set of statutes that determine whether a student could be considered a resident or not and some of it's not quite what you might think so what I often recommend folks to do in this case is speak to someone about this at the institutions that you're looking at, because again, it can vary significantly by state, it can vary significantly by institution, but um, it's really important as, as uh, several folks have said already, ask the questions, you know, ask the questions about the explain the situation, don't hold back, explain exactly where you are, how long you've been there, how long you intend to stay there, when you're coming, where your parents are, all those kind of things and let the institution uh, guide you through the process. Uh, otherwise, it's very, very difficult to do this on your own because again, the, the rules are so complex and there's so many exceptions to the rules. It's just helpful to have somebody guide you through the process. Thank you, Joey. Um, and thank you everyone for taking the time to answer the questions that have been coming in um, and, and questions that um, folks submitted with registration. Um, I wanna be mindful of the time, but I do wanna give everyone um, just a minute to let you kind of share your last words of advice that you would give students and families um, to help them think about navigating um, the uh, affording college and, and applying to scholarships. What's maybe um, a last words of advice that you would share? Um, and Steve, we'll start with you. I asked members of my staff this question today to get their answer and every one of them said the same thing. Tell them to check their email because <laughs> Those of us who are older than 18 um, <laughs> may have grown up with email and students aren't really utilizing email. But one of the important distinctions for a family, particularly if you're the first um, 
member of your family to go to college is you're, you're being admitted to the institution. The aid is to the student. And there are regulations we have to follow about how we communicate with family members or guardians. Um, it is the student who will be receiving most of the information. So please check your email. Other things that I was uh, asked to say by my wonderful colleague, Delatum, you have to learn how to solve issues on your own and be an adult. Think about things from an adult point of view. And that's a challenge for someone who's 18 um, and you know, coming into an institution as a first year student, let's say. But it is important that uh, the student take responsibility for, especially if they are going to be receiving financial aid and a, perhaps a significant amount of aid, there may be regulations and rules and things the student will have to do in order to remain eligible for that aid. They have to keep a certain grade point average, for example. So it is really important that the student understands as much fun as they're going to have in college and they want to get into the institution of their choice, having financial aid is a responsibility and they can't neglect that responsibility. Thank you, Steve. I will let Joey and Shana jump in. I think Steve said it very, very well. It's, just, it's a very important to, to take a lot of these things seriously and at the same time, um, not let it become overwhelming. Um, I often encourage families to take this in, in small chunks, if you will. It can be really overwhelming coming to college, especially if you're a first-generation college student. You break it down into different pieces and different parts. It becomes a little easier to manage. And uh, trust the school, you know, ask questions, trust what the school tells you. The, the schools are in the business of, of helping you succeed and they wanna see you succeed. And sometimes a simple question or a simple visit to an office or a phone call or an email can open up doors that you had no idea were available. So I tell folks just focus on, on the P, one piece at a time, look at the big picture and trust the school, follow the school's advice, follow their guidelines, and most of the time things will fall into place as they should. I think that's great advice. I think I would echo what, what Joey said, um, to, to rely on those resources that are there for you. Um, too many times when I talk to a student or a family, they have reached out to everyone except the financial aid office. Um, they've called FAFSA, they've called the state, they've called their academic advisor, and um, they could have saved a lot of time and started with the financial aid office. Uh, we're there to help. And uh, when it comes to your financial aid, your scholarships, your grants, the financial aid office is the, is the place that has the answers that you need. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing your advice um, and your knowledge with students and families today. Um, I do want to thank you for, for joining us today. And I also want to draw folks' attention to um, a couple links that were just dropped in the chat. My colleague Derek just shared um, a survey that you can fill out to give us feedback on how we can make um, these sessions better and to let us know what worked well. So please take a moment to do that. And uh, be entered to win a $25 um, Amazon gift card. Um, and also just want to let folks know that we will be hosting other sessions this fall. Um, so feel free to join us. Um, we've just dropped the link for our other um, fall events that are happening. So take a look um, and register for them if you're interested in attending. Um, know that this will be shared and uploaded on our website. It's also going to be emailed to folks. So if you have, if you ever want to go back to anything, you're able to do that. Um, but I do, again, want to sincerely thank our panelists for their time and thank all of our attendees for participating today. I hope everyone has a great night and thank you so much for your time.